Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs, most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All so individuals do matter. And I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. Tonight I'll talk a little bit uh, about community-based HIV care and then talk about uh, Rwanda um, and also a little bit about Lesotho, that is about taking this model that was really developed in Haiti and uh, d uh, spreading it elsewhere. First, uh, I'd like to remind people of something. Um, I remember the first time I saw this, uh, it's from the British Medical Journal and I thought, oh, I saw this years ago. I thought uh, Jonathan Mann, in fact, had uh, had made these projections, but then I looked at it more closely and it wasn't projections. It just looked like the projections that he and many others had made years previously. Uh, this was in fact based on data. Of course, data is hard to come by in many of these countries, but what it showed was a very massive uh, decrease in life expectancy. And of course, one of the chief reasons, or maybe the chief reason uh, for this decrease in life expectancy, which has been dramatic and awful, has been the advent of HIV. HIV, of course, being tightly linked to tuberculosis and other pathogens, and also uh, malnutrition, which is an infectious disease. Now, notice the shape of these curves. For those of you who are not interested in looking at graphs um, or curves, uh, look at the shape of the curve, and then the next slide is very similarly shaped. But this is not decreased life expectancy, it's rather decreased death expectancy. Even in, even in our country, even with its lack of a very robust public health system, um, we still saw a very profound uh, impact of antiretroviral therapy on uh, ca case fatality among uh, patients living already with HIV. Uh, so when I was an intern in 1991 at a Harvard teaching hospital, we had lots of patients with HIV disease in the hospital doing very poorly, as you might imagine. Um, and a substantial fraction of the beds in a teaching hospital at that time uh, were occupied by people with HIV. And that, that was true even in smaller cities like Charlottesville, certainly true in, in big American cities. But around 1994-95, we all knew that combination chemotherapy with three antiretroviral drugs, aka antiretroviral therapy, would suppress viral load and prevent people from dying. Um, and so we started in 1998 buying some of the medications collecting uh, uh, unexpired medications that, that were no longer being used by patients, and, uh, and then also concessionally priced medications, and bringing them to Haiti and putting people on a a ART. So a very difficult time between 1998 and, and, and 2002, and I'm going to talk about 2002 for a reason. When you read, these are from abstracts, and there were two papers cited, if I recall correctly. One of them was from a mathematical modeling exercise. Now, mathematical modeling, I have no, no gripe against mathematical modeling or computer modeling. But let's just say there's really a broad range of possibility with a mathematical model. So, for example, people are modeling the potential of avian flu. They'll say, well, we could either have four million cases or four. You know, there's a broad range. It's not the most 
strong methodology in the, um, in the toolkit of academia. And the other one other was data from the cost projections of a project in West Africa that had not even started. So I said, well, gee, that's an awfully thin or slender thread of data upon which to base such a bold claim that it's 28 times more uh, cost effective to do A rather than B. And so then I asked our drug procurement team at Partners in Health, actually the drug procurement team was at that time one person, but it sounds better to say drug procurement team. Actually, she has a big jacket that says DTU drug trafficking unit, but we decided she shouldn't really wear that. Anyway, next slide. <laughs> so this is what she sent me. She said, well, here are the real data. Here's average wholesale price for two regimens, and then uh, what we were paying, PIH, with a mix of those, as I said, um, at that point starting to get some generic uh, drugs and also still some concessionally priced uh, branded pharmaceuticals, and then finally IDA, which is the International Dispensary Association. Now the price renegotiated by the Clinton Foundation and others in, through pooled procurement so that we're all ordering together is about 50 cents a day. So that's pretty exciting. I talked about uh, our initiative and hey, the HIV equity initiative that we started that year, 1998. And just a couple things about it because I know you're not, it's not all of you are interested in all the programmatic details, but the short version of this is that it's based very largely on a tuberculosis program. That is, the costs of tuberculosis diagnosis and care here in Charlottesville or in Malawi or in Haiti are not borne by the patient because it's considered a public good for public health. So what we said is, well, if HIV disease is the leading infectious killer of young adults in Haiti and in many other parts of the world where we work, then surely it is also a public health problem and that we can adopt the same approach in terms of funding, which doesn't mean that it doesn't cost anything. It just means that we're not asking, pa we're not asking patients to pay for these services and also we're not allowing their own poverty to determine when, or when they adhere to our regimens. And those of you working in, on ART projects in poor regions, or even here, poor parts of the United States, know that when you have to, when patients have to pay for these services, they may take them sometimes and not other times. So we just removed that all, as had been done with TB, removed that from the equation. We also use community-based care, which is the subject of my talk today, meaning working with community health workers, who we call accompaniateurs, to make sure that patients get their meds. And we don't really follow viral loads. We don't have that technology. What we follow, we use a very, very difficult um, scientific assessment called weighing the patient. <laughs> and if you, if you uh, are really radical, you can do something unheard of in medicine and even falling out of uh, style in nursing. That is, you can ask the patient how they feel. Um, a student of mine who's now a colleague of mine, his name is David Walton. He was, for five years while he was at Harvard Medical School, he went back and forth. Uh, to this one town. And I got an email from David Walton, and he described this patient to me, this 26 year old man, let's say weighs 80 pounds, CD4 count 36, I won't go into the clinical details, and he has HIV disease and tuberculosis. And I wrote back, he said, can you come see this patient? I said, sure, I'll see this patient, but what's the deal? I mean, you guys are used to taking care of people like this, why do you need me? And uh, he said, well, he's really discouraged and we want you to talk to him. Now, secretly, I was very thrilled that they were essentially asking me to do a psychiatric or social work consult. But, you know, I pretended, I said, well, you know, I'm a highly trained infectious disease doctor. I didn't really say that. But well, I, I did go see the patient and talk to him and to his family, and I, I said, you know, if you, if you take these medicines and have a community health worker, you're gonna get better. And he did, and, and I'll show you some more. No, I'm, I'm glad that a lot of people Ex exclaim, I, you know, I still look at pictures like this. I'm going to show you some more from Rwanda. But uh, when this, this, you know, this happens all the time, every week, really every day when you have thousands of patients, as we do, with chronic conceptive diseases. And I'm going to talk about food, as I mentioned. But first, I, I, uh, you see the, this is really sort of the model. There's Joseph. There's the community health worker. That's it. Um, and this is not what I would call, or many people call, directly observed therapy. It's really a, that's kind of a cheesy expression for something a lot nicer than that. He's got a neighbor who's looking out for him on a daily basis. Now he can look out for his a neighbor or several of his on a daily basis. Anyway, and, and you can see here, this is a picture of him some, maybe a year later, actually 
doing what I'm doing today, which is giving a talk about his own experience with images of himself before and after behind him. If you can look in the picture. Anyway, this appeared in the World Health Report because I, I asked him if I could use his pictures. All the patient's pictures you'll see have been, are used, of course, with their approbation. And his rather smart alecky, he's got a good sense of humor, but his rather smart alecky response to me was, uh, sure, Dr. Paul, it's not like I get invited to give these, give these talks. Those of you who were there last night know that he did go to the AIDS meeting in Toronto. Uh, just sort of a punitive measure on my part, you know. <laughs> so, he, so he would stop saying that. But when I showed him this, he looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> anyway, so I mentioned, <clears throat> I mentioned scaling up, you know, and asking the question, can it be done? And we, we, we got this a lot in our work in Haiti. Next slide. These are all places that are in the public sector where we we built in a, that squatter's so a big giant referral hospital with 104 beds and two ORs and women's health clinic and ID clinic and a national referral center for Douglas and TB. And we're proud of that. I'm glad that we did it. But it's not enough, as I've been discussing the last couple of days here in Charlottesville, it's not enough if we want to promote basic rights. If we want to promote basic rights, we better think, even if we're from universities, or NGOs. I'm, I work in a small community college in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. But if we're from universities or NGOs or church groups, we better think a little bit about rebuilding the public sector because that's where poor people, citizens, get their rights. You know, when I was a kid going to school, I had to go to the public health clinic and get my shots before I could enroll in school. And that I thought of, of course, as a six-year-old, I thought, how annoying. Uh, but as a grown-up, I think, isn't it great that we still haven't lost that? And of course, these, these uh, gains in public health and public education, we could lose them if we don't fight for them. They, they're not readily available all throughout the world. So we long wanted to go to Rwanda. Uh, we wanted to go to Africa, I guess is what I'm saying. Where's my colleague from Rwanda? She doesn't, never been to Rwanda yet, but she's going to be my colleague from Rwanda. There she is. Um, so these pictures I can dedicate to you, OK? As long as you pass your pharmacology exam tomorrow. Um, no pass, no come to Rwanda. So <laughs> this is how we do advanced pedagogy at Harvard. We threaten the students. So we got an invitation, um, or many invitations, really, from the Ministry of Health of Rwanda. But we didn't really have the funding. And then the Clinton Foundation was launching, back some years ago, uh, an HIV AIDS initiative. And they asked us to join them. And we said, well, we can't. Join, you know, we can't go to Africa until we have our work in Haiti uh, def you know, shored up and protected because there's a lot of difficult things going on in Haiti right now. This was 2004, for those of you who are working in Haiti. And they said, yes, we understand that. We'll help you both with your Haiti projects, funding-wise. Bless you. And if you have cough, you can see me afterwards. Um, <laughs> we, we, you know, they said, we'll help you raise the money for the Rwanda and Haiti projects. And they did. And so off we went to this hospital. And I, I have this very scientific instrument that I've spent 15 years developing, tested with NIH funding, team of 15 Harvard School of Public Health students testing its validity, inter, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, I go to a hospital, and in order to find out if it's good, I look and see if the latrines are clean and if there's flowers planted. That's my scientific instrument. I also go and see, are there any doctors, a lab, x-ray. So I went there. And they, it was clean, there was, there was gardens, there were doctors, there was, the lab had electricity. It wasn't great, but it was functioning. So I went back to the capital and I said to the minister, whose name, rather deliciously, is Dr. Innocent. I said, Dr. Innocent and my friend, Dr. Agnes, you know, you can send us somewhere more difficult. And, you know, the subtext being, it's sort of, you have public health humor, I mentioned. There's also public health machismo. <laughs> and it's not a good idea, as the next picture suggests, because this is where they sent us. <laughs> so they both looked at each other and said, OK, we got just the place for you. <laughs> and they sent us to an abandoned hospital which actually, all levity aside, was a good thing for us. Because after building those hospitals in Haiti, we thought, we'll just call the Haitians to come and help us. So you've heard of South-South solidarity, other kind of goofy constructs like that. It really is true, though. You can do it. Um, and the Haitians came over and helped us redo this place. And I'll just give next picture. just shows that's pediatrics before, and that's pediatrics about half a year later. 
And we did this throughout the whole, and we're doing it in the second hospital now. I promised to talk about food, and Becca Dillingham and others, including others here at the center, we're taking food seriously. Well, that sounds really silly. We're taking food seriously. Come to Long John Silver for free. <laughs> anyway, what I mean is we're taking our patients' food security seriously. And, and the, you know, since I, you, I used the Joseph picture a lot, let me just say it's nothing to do with Haiti. The same thing in Rwanda. This is a guy named John, actually, who came in. Uh, he has HIV and TB, yes, but it's actually not the HIV that, that was getting him. It was the TB and malnutrition. His CD4 count was over 500, I think, when this picture was taken. I mean, this is just after, this is before ART. And in fact, you know, he goes from looking like Skeletor to looking like he needs Lipitor. But anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so uh, he's going to be working with us soon if he isn't already. And we have, again, you know, I, if I, as a doctor, if, if I could see this only once in my life as a clinician, it would be pretty cool. But to see it every week, patients who... Are, are sick with a consumptive disease and malnutrition, and then to see them some months later responding like this is very gratifying and moving to me as a doctor. Now, we have been involved in these long-standing arguments about, can, is it really, again, sustainable to do this kind of work? You, you know, if you think people are, uh, you know, going to come up and say, great work you're doing. The patients say that, their families say that, the, the African doctors say that, but our peers don't say that. They say this isn't sustainable. This isn't cost effective. It's gold plated. Our friends at the Clinton Foundation, including President Clinton, said, you know, we really ought to do a cost exercise to find out how much this costs. And he sent a team, or they sent a team of people from places like McKinsey or these titans of finance. They were nice people. And they just took all of our receipts and went through the receipts for a year. And then they gave us the report about two months ago. And here's, here's what, here's what it, Nshuti Mubuzima means partners in health in Kenya Rwanda. I know you all know that, but I thought I'd, just for the two or three of you who don't speak Kenya Rwanda, I'd translate. So first of all, the community health workers are, who we, we insist that they be stipended, you know? I mean, again, it's a very complicated notion that poor people should actually be paid for their labor. But anyway, we say, <laughs> let people like me a Harvard professor, I can volunteer. I can afford to be a volunteer. But we can't ask you know, poor people who should be planting corn or millet to feed their children, don't ask them to volunteer. We have, they have to have a stipend. Only 4.2% of our budget went to a company that is paying them, not asking them to be faux volunteers, which they can't do. A big, the biggest chunk, then, is labor. And again, I don't find that an embarrassment to go into a place in rural Africa where unemployment is 60 to 70 percent, where 67 per, 60 to 70 percent of the population we're serving, about half a million people, are, were displaced by war or genocide. You know, they're, they're, they're people who've shown up and live in temporary refugee settlements. And so spending 45 percent of your budget on labor, to me, that's not an embarrassment. Any more than it is an embarrassment to spend 19% uh, of your budget on food around hungry people. I don't think that's an embarrassment either. It does challenge us, though, to figure out ways to reduce the prices of food at the same time that we do not undermine local producers. And again, as a doctor and an anthropologist and an infectious disease doctor, I don't know a lot about this. I had to learn it. And I'm sure you will, too. We have to learn more about, now here I think sustainable is a good word, sustainable agriculture. How can we promote that in the middle of rural Rwanda? And we're doing that now uh, with the Clinton Foundation and a new initiative funded by um, uh, someone named Tom Hunter, who's from Scotland. That we're trying to get water and food and agricultural, not subsidies, but in improving seed quality, making sure people have access to fertilizer, et cetera. And I was going to talk about Lesotho, but I thought maybe I would talk more about what, what about the role of a research university, like UVA? Where do we fit in? Uh, we did go to Lesotho, and there are several people in the room who are working in Lesotho. Everywhere we go, by the way, we insist that PIH start a sister organization that has a local name, like Nshuti Mubuzima in Kenyawanda, which means uh, PIH in, uh, in that language. And so when we went to Lesotho, I said, OK, what's the Basotho word for 
PIH. And they said, uh, it's really kind of complicated. I said, hey, you know, I'm an anthropologist. Bring it on. <laughs> I said, what's well, really, maybe you should just call it PIH Lesotho. It's really, it's got some clit. And I said, come on, we can say it. Next slide. Well, we can't say it. <laughs> uh, so I will, I just want to show this image instead of talking about Lesotho because, again, this is not a, a this is a Haitian doctor. This is Dr. Jonas Rigaudin. Um, I, I, after telling anecdotes about my dear colleague, Dr. Desigre, I can just tell you one thing about Dr. Rigaudin. He, like I, did not know that in the month of August you can get snowed in to Lesotho. Poor Dr. Rigaudin, he looked at me and said, it's so cold here, can I go back to Rwanda? Anyway, but he stayed and he has done incredible work way up in the mountains. And some of you here today will go visit them. Now, wh what is it that research universities do? You know, all of them now that I know, all the big ones like UVA, have said, well, we're putting global health back, we're, we're going to put global health on our agenda as a university. The problem is, and this is a challenge, we can talk about this in, uh, in the discussion period, and I'll, I'll open it very shortly. The problem is that we're ill-prepared as research universities to, to do work like this in Africa or Haiti. Because although we have the strength in the arena of teaching and research, with a few exceptions, including the nursing school, and I'd like to, and I'm sure the teaching hospitals, we don't have a lot of service experience. And it's a big challenge because it's not as if students who want to do this work, including many here today, they don't want to go off and be spectators to poverty, as I was saying earlier this afternoon. They want to do something useful for the people who are there around. And in order to do that, we need to have, I, I've got to think of a better word, but we need to have effector arms where we can have an impact and effect in poor communities. And that we haven't worked out yet. And a lot of universities are very risk averse, right? They have lawyers. Any lawyers here? Am I in trouble? Well, okay, any university lawyers here? Okay, so we're, we're clear. Um, clear? Um, anyway, so... So lawyers, university lawyers are risk averse. They're not going to want us to go into these risky places and, and start treating patients you know, in places like this. We have to do it anyway. So maybe you, like we, will have to develop your own effector arms, like Partners in Health, that are affiliated with, but not entirely subject to, the rules, regulations, or desires of a research university. Because the well-being of the poor is not high on the charter of most US research universities. Should be. Actually, if you look at the, the mission statements of a lot of the medical schools, they really ought to be doing more of this anyway. And I'm sure it's the same in the nursing schools. Harvard doesn't have a nursing school, uh, but Duke does, and you do. And you know, we should look hard at the mission statement and say, OK, how can we make that happen? Not just in Virginia, which is really important to do. There's a lot of the, all these things I'm saying about you know, Africa or Haiti they have a lot of relevance, I believe, right here in the United States. For example, we took the Haiti model uh, using community health workers and brought it to to Boston, not because, meaning using community health workers, not because you use community health workers when there are no doctors, or because there are no doctors, but because community health workers can allow us to introduce the highest standard of care for chronic disease, whether there are doctors and nurses present or not. I made the mistake in talking about this Haiti model in Boston of saying to my colleagues at Harvard, all I'm trying to do is raise the Harvard standard of care to Haiti levels. <laughs> Didn't, it backfired. Um, anyway, we have done this, and we need to, you will have to grapple with this, and the, not just the center, but all of the university, and I think there's lots of good things that happen. A little bit of good news, there's lots of resources out there that if you look at the dates, were not, as they say, online only a few years ago. So the students here today who are interested in global health, you'll have an easier time of it than, than you know, I did when I was a student, or we did when we were students. So there's a lot, lot that we can hope for. But just to... A last, rather conceptual image or two. We've been working, as you are, on trying to develop uh, more of a delivery or implementation science. So, if there, you know, one of the things that's key to, you think about AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, not a single one have uh, a vaccine. Uh, so, we, we have to do discovery, and that's going to come from basic science, from research labs. So, don't just because I'm talking about delivery doesn't mean we don't need the basic science discovery. Then we need development. Like we were talking today about some 
RNA or DNA analyses that can make a huge difference in our work, both in terms of diagnostics and we were talk, I was talking with, to, to Dr. Garant today about, you know, rapid diagnostics, not just from amoebiasis, which someone here, Rita, was working on. I don't know if she's here now. If she's not, minus 10 for Gryffindor. But, uh, <laughs> but also, you know, rapid dipsticks to, to see if their uh, water is fecally contaminated. There's lots of the basic science is done, but then we don't have the development of the product so that someone like me or other people who are doing a lot of the delivery or uh, work, we, we can't get access to tools. You know, we, they're not available to us. Um, and then finally, after the discovery and development, there needs to be a lot more focus on delivery. I, I've met some people involved in business at business schools who think that it, it's incredibly, incredible how rudimentary the science of delivery is in medicine and public health. And I'm afraid they're right. Uh, they think they know more about this than we do, and I think they may. You know, we, we just now are starting to assess our own tools in medicine and public health in a critical manner, and we don't have a lot going. So once we address all of these, we can ad also address these huge problems. I talked about one or two of them, but there are many. You know, just thinking about malnutrition, enteropathies and diarrhea, and the long list of things that are mental health, chronic mental health issues, the long list are taking, uh, cutting short lives or making people miserable. We do have deliverables for many of them. We do have something we can d deliver, but we have to have uh, strong uh, mechanisms. I, I went into the school in, in Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria, and I w it was a primary school, and I saw this, and I know that what the teacher meant was do not erase when he wrote save, but I saw something else, and it really made me kind of choked up when I saw it, uh, because this was a place where there was more fertile land than we saw in, uh, in Haiti or even Rwanda, but there were a lot of children and a lot of old people, but not a lot of young adults. And because, you know, it's, it wasn't entirely because of inaction initially, because this is where that epidemic started. And everywhere that uh, HIV is in Africa, there's also TB and malaria. But it became inaction when, again, we had the tools, but didn't act promptly enough. And, you know, you go there now, as I said, next slide, last slide, there's lots of kids. Well, I'm actually in the back in the middle, if you can't see me, but there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of children and a lot of older people, but there's not a generation of people my age or, or younger who are taking care of these kids. And we need to make sure that this doesn't happen anymore, that it doesn't happen again. And when I come to a place like UVA and feel the energy and excitement, especially among the students and trainees, but also among the, uh, members of the faculty, it's very inspiring to me. And I thank you all for having me back here and look forward to working together in the future. Thank you very much.